Alice, with whom we had lived together for nine years and I were reading the news on our tablets, having finished our Saturday morning breakfast, when the doorbell rang. Alice jumped slightly in surprise. I'd noticed that she'd been a bit jumpy and clingy over the past week or so, and her clinginess had resulted in some very good sex. Much better than the boring, uninspired sex we'd had in the previous six months. I'll get it, I said, putting my iPad on the table and heading for the door. As I opened the door, I saw two men showing badges identifying them as police officers. Hello, what can I do for you? I asked. Mr. Brian Campbell? The bigger one asked. I nodded. We're Officers Stevens and Peters with the Austin Police Department. Sir, we're here to execute a search warrant, he said, handing me a packet of papers. A search warrant? I exclaimed in confusion. For what? Ene Sir, it's all described in the warrant. We'll give you a few minutes to review it. You can also call your attorney if you feel it's necessary. We'd also like to speak to your wife, Alice Campbell, if she's available. She's in the kitchen, I said as I escorted the two police officers into the hallway and read the warrant. I found that the warrant was indeed directed at my wife, Alice, specifically for any firearms she might own and any property that might belong to Mr. Conrad O'Brien. Returning with the police officers to the kitchen, I asked, Does this have anything to do with that rich guy they found dead last week? My wife works for one of his companies, but we don't know him. I've never even met the guy. Having said that, I looked up and saw my wife's face turn pale and her eyes look like saucers. If they wanted to see a guilty face, they didn't need to look any further. Alice, do you know what this is about? They have a warrant to search our house, and that warrant implies that you had something to do with Conrad O'Brien's murder, I said with irritation in my voice. Sir, please allow us to ask questions. Would you mind taking a seat somewhere outside the kitchen? We have some questions we'd like to ask Mrs. Campbell. Is she under arrest? I asked. I really think she should see a lawyer before asking her a bunch of questions. Alice, do you want me to call my lawyer and see if he can find someone to represent you? Yes, please, Alice said meekly, tears welling up in the corners of her eyes. That's her right, of course, said one of the police officers. Why don't we schedule the interview for next week? Right now we're just collecting evidence and no one has been arrested. In fact, we'd like to interview you too, Mr. Campbell. We can do that at the station at the same time as we interview your wife. Of course, you're entitled to legal representation during the interview if you wish. And one more question, sir. Do you have any firearms in your home that we should be aware of? First of all, I'm happy to talk to you here instead of at the station. I've never met O'Brien, and I have nothing to hide. Second, yes, I do own several guns, and they are all locked in my gun safe, except for one of my guns, which is in my bedside table drawer. Would Officer Peters please accompany you to retrieve the gun from your bedside table, and then could you open your gun safe so we can take a look? Realizing that I didn't have much choice and wanting to appear cooperative, I replied, Sure, follow me. It's right this way. And I led Officer Peters into the master bedroom. Once there, I pointed to my bedside table. It's in the top drawer. Putting on gloves, Officer Peters opened the desk drawer and carefully removed my Taurus judge using an evidence rod and placed the gun in a collection bag. Thank you, sir. Could you please take me to your gun safe? Uh, sure. Right this way, I said, leading him into my office. Once there, I entered the combination and opened the large heavy door of the gun safe. Sir, we're going to bring all the firearms to our lab for testing. Before we leave, we'll give you a receipt for the seized items. Once everything has been tested, they will be returned to you. Okay, I said, realizing I had no choice. Peters spoke into a small microphone. Michaels, I need you and your team to come here and start an inventory of the owner's firearms. Okay, boss, I'll be right there. I heard a voice come out of the speaker. A few moments later, Michaels and his team were in my office with evidence containers and bags to inventory and seize the firearms. I looked at Peters and he nodded, then coughed. Okay, guys, we're here to search the premises for any items listed on the warrant. Specifically, we're looking for any additional firearms. Michaels will assign each of you a search area. Let's get busy.
Over the next few hours, the team spread out and thoroughly searched our home and our two cars that were parked in the garage. While they weren't destructive, our home was certainly a mess when the search was completed. We waited for about ten minutes while the forensics team and two police officers conferred at their cars. I kept looking at Alice, giving her my best what-the-hell-is-going-on look. Then Officer Peters knocked on the door. I opened it and he handed me a receipt and thanked me for my cooperation in the search. As if I had a choice. I nodded looking over the receipt and noting that all they had taken were firearms, five long guns, and four submachine guns. He asked if he could speak to Mrs. Campbell, and I escorted him back to our house. Alice was still sitting at the kitchen table. Her head was down and she seemed to be crying. The policeman asked softly, Mrs. Campbell? To which she looked up. He handed her a copy of his business card and told her to arrange an interview at the station this week when her lawyer was free. She nodded and said, Okay. He then asked if he and his partner could talk to me in my office, and that I had the right to an attorney if I wanted one. I said I didn't need a lawyer because I had never met O'Brien and I had nothing to hide. The interview was thorough but lasted no more than an hour since I had never even met O'Brien. They wanted to know if I had any beef with this asshole who apparently had my wife and to check my alibi. They asked about my whereabouts the night O'Brien was killed. I asked what night it happened and they gave me the date. I opened my iPhone and looked at the calendar. I was visiting my friend, Lee Rogers, at his house. Alice told me she was going to spend the night at her aunt's house in Fredericksburg, so I called Lee and he invited me over. When asked what we did, I said we had dinner with Lee's wife, Pat. We talked for a while after dinner and then Lee took me in his private plane, as he is an avid pilot. I explained that his neighborhood, the Breakaway Park Flying Community in Cedar Park, has a private airstrip, and many residents, including Lee, have their own airplanes and hangars. It turned out that the cops knew the neighborhood. I told them we left at about 8 p.m. and returned about an hour or so later. They asked who was flying the airplane, and I said I wasn't a pilot, but Lee had been a military pilot for many years, so I was quite comfortable flying it. They indicated that they might need to confirm my story, so I gave them Lee's full name, address, and phone number. I later talked to Lee and learned that the police interviewed Lee and Pat at their home, and they both confirmed my story. They also provided the police with surveillance footage they had obtained from the HOA. The footage was recorded with a camera pointed at the runway, showing airplanes taking off and landing on the runway. The video confirmed that Lee's plane left at 8.05 p.m. and returned at 9.15 p.m. The police officers thanked me for my cooperation and left. I went back into the kitchen and talked to my wife. What the hell is this all about? You work for one of his companies, but I didn't think you ever dated that asshole O'Brien? What the hell is going on, Alice? You had an affair with that asshole? She looked up at me, her bottom lip trembling and tears rolling from her eyes. She moaned. I'm so sorry, and jumped up from her seat and rushed into our bedroom, closing and locking the door behind her. The following week was tumultuous. The local news stations learned of the search warrant and hounded Alice and me for interviews or comment. Conrad O'Brien's murder was the top local news story. We said nothing, just like her lawyer told us to. My lawyer referred Alice to Ted Walker, the city's criminal defense attorney. For some reason, Alice didn't want me to attend the meeting she had scheduled with Ted for Monday afternoon. Something was clearly wrong. O'Brien made millions in software development and online projects. His companies had once employed over a thousand people locally before he'd moved most of his development to India a few years ago to cut costs. Nevertheless, he was often in the news, often because of some charity work, and he still employed quite a few people, including Alice. However, rumor had it that old Conrad was a womanizer and especially liked to bet attractive married women. Walker arranged to meet Alice at the police station on Friday at 9.30 a.m. She reported that Ted thought the police were just fishing for information and that he doubted anything would come of it. Well, Ted couldn't have been more wrong. Around 11.30 Friday morning, I received a call from a distraught Alice informing me that after the interview, the police had arrested her and charged her with the murder of Conrad O'Brien. She had been arrested and placed in a cell at the downtown women's jail, and a bail hearing was scheduled for the following Monday. I asked if I could come to the bail hearing and was told it was closed to the public. 
Late Monday night, I received a phone call from Alice and I thought she was crying. She said she had a $500,000 bail set for her and asked me to bail her out. Since I've never been involved with the criminal justice system, I googled bail and learned that the bail bondsman likely loses a non-refundable fee of 10% of the bail amount. Hell, $50,000 will never get back. I started a successful recruiting business a few years ago, and we were doing very well financially, but still $50,000 is a lot of money. I told her that before I shelled out that amount of money, I wanted to meet with her, and she had to be honest with me about what was going on. She agreed to do that. I guess she didn't have much choice if she wanted my cooperation. Walker set up an interview for us in the interrogation room at the prison and said he wanted to be there to explain everything. I arrived at the prison where I was checked and made sure I didn't have any contraband or weapons, and then I was led into the interrogation room normally used by defendants and their attorneys. Walker and Alice were in the room. Alice was wearing an orange jumpsuit. It didn't look good on her. Instead of getting answers directly from Alice, Walker acted as her mouthpiece. He said I would probably find out the facts anyway, so he was willing to tell me what I wanted to know. He said that O'Brien and Alice had an affair that lasted about six months and didn't end until after his death. I was shocked by this revelation and looked angrily at Alice. You fucking slut! No wonder sex with you was so fucking boring until that asshole died. He was taking advantage of you, wasn't he? You bitch! Alice sat stunned and saddened by my outburst, bowing her head and crying. Walker said he understood how upset I was by the news and asked me to take a few minutes and calm down. He said he was sure. Although Alice was having an affair with O'Brien, she hadn't killed him. Really? I asked. If you're so damn sure, then why did they arrest her for his murder? They must have some very strong evidence against her. Walker went on to explain that the murder took place on O'Brien's 300 Hectare Ranch, located in the Texas Highlands west of Austin. The ranch house was a mini-mansion, smaller than O'Brien's luxurious Lake Austin dwelling, but it was still a two-story home of more than 450 square feet with a swimming pool and tennis court. The house had exterior surveillance cameras equipped with night vision devices that captured any vehicle or foot traffic approaching the house from all directions. There were also cameras inside the house, but O'Brien only turned them on when he was away, and indeed, those cameras were turned off when he was killed. Ted went on to explain that the police showed surveillance footage that showed O'Brien's Lamborghini traveling down the driveway to the house at 9 p.m. on the night he was killed. A camera in the house clearly recorded him entering the garage before he turned off the interior cameras. At about 10 p.m., outdoor cameras captured Alice's Lexus driving down the driveway and parking outside. They clearly show Alice walking up to the front door and going inside. I found how famously she went inside to be just as disjointed as the rest of this sordid affair. A few minutes later, the same camera captured Alice hurriedly exiting the house and practically running to her car, hurrying away. Oh, shit! I exclaimed. It sure as hell looks like she did it. I looked at Alice. Did you really do it? I asked. Her lawyer tried to keep her from answering, but she didn't heed his advice. No, I swear to you, I didn't do it. When I walked in, I saw him sitting in his chair. I could see his legs, but he was sitting with his back to me. He didn't answer my call, so I thought he was asleep. When I walked around the chair and looked at him, he had a hole in his forehead, right between his eyes, and his chest was all bloody. I screamed and panicked and ran back to my car. I'm not sure why I should believe you. After all, you've already admitted that you're a lying, conniving bitch who spent six months having an affair behind my back while I worked my ass off to provide you with the life most women would dream of. I'm also not sure why I should shell out $50,000 to get you out of this joint. Walker tried to inject some much-needed calm and logic into the conversation. He explained that since we were under common ownership, half of our money belonged to Alice and that they could get that $50,000 with or without my help. Eventually, I gave in and decided to cooperate, but let Alice know that regardless of my cooperation, it was over between us. Walker was optimistic that Alice would be able to avoid charges, despite the fact that she was at O'Brien's house and fled the scene without calling the police. Walker summarized the evidence collected by the police. The good news is that ballistics testing did not identify any of the guns from your house as the murder weapon. 
Unfortunately, the bad news is that the only people who appeared on O'Brien's surveillance footage over the last week were O'Brien and Mrs. Campbell. Details of the case have hit the media, and they have made our lives a living hell, following us outside of our home, when we weren't home, and even outside of my office. Some of the questions I was asked made me look like an ignorant cuckold, asked if I knew she was having an affair with O'Brien and so on. I guess I was an ignorant cuckold. I once snapped at reporters that I had never even met O'Brien, nor was I aware of any relationship between O'Brien and my wife. I, of course, would never let that happen. I kicked Alice out of our bedroom, and now she slept in the guest room and used the guest bathroom. She told me that Walker said we needed to look like a friendly couple, so that her public opinion wouldn't be too tarnished, possibly affecting future jurors. Screw you, Alice. Now that your boyfriend is dead, you want to be a friendly couple? Where was that friendly attitude when you dumped me and slept with that asshole? You know, after hearing Walker lay out the prosecution's evidence, I think you did it. You're not only a conniving traitor, you're a cold-blooded murderer. I'm glad the state kept my firearms until the case was over. I can't trust you as far as I can throw your sorry ass. I even put a deadbolt on my bedroom door so you can't get to me while I'm sleeping. In response, she looked at me with a shocked expression on her face. At least that's what she was getting. The DA met with Walker and Alice several times, trying to negotiate a plea bargain. They struck a two-year manslaughter deal of which she had to serve one year before she would be eligible for parole. Why such a lenient sentence? I'm guessing the prosecution had a big problem with motive. Why would Alice want to kill O'Brien? Apparently he was kind to her and gave her nice gifts, even set up a secret bank account where he wired money to her. When I found out about her secret account, I insisted she give me back the $50,000 I had bailed her out of jail. They also had the problem that despite their best efforts, they were still unable to find the murder weapon. Although Alice insisted on her innocence, Walker begged her to take a plea bargain because all the evidence, except for the motive and murder weapon, was against her, and a plea bargain was very favorable. Why risk a jury convicting her of murder? The jury wasn't going to sympathize with a woman who had a six-month affair, and the cameras showed that it was just her and O'Brien in the house. With tears in her eyes, she finally agreed. A week later, the judge approved the plea bargain, and ordered Alice to report to the women's prison in two weeks. As I left the courtroom, I handed her my divorce petition. There's nothing like hitting a cheating girlfriend when she's desperate. The day before she was due to report to jail, Alice asked if I could sit down and talk to her. She disgusted me, and I really didn't want to talk to her, so I told her I would talk to her if after our discussion she agreed to sign a divorce petition. She agreed, and I arranged for my attorney to come to our house at 7 p.m. with my notary. The divorce was a standard 50-50th split, except that she received no share of my business and no alimony, or maintenance as they call it in Texas. The combined assets also included $250,000 that was in her secret account given to her by O'Brien. I didn't care that it was whore money. They worked just like any other money and helped her not cling to my assets. My lawyer and his notary will be here in an hour. After that, you'll agree to sign the papers, right? Yes, I'll sign the papers. Thanks for talking to me. I wanted to tell you that I'm really, really sorry I ever got involved with Conrad. I was in a tough spot and you were working hard. We met at a coffee shop and he charmed me. He made me feel better at a time when I felt like crap. However, that's no excuse. I knew who he was and that he owned the company I worked for. I had also heard rumors that he was a womanizer and had a reputation for liking to court married women. I must admit... I was flattered that he was courting me. You're a beautiful woman, and I'd be surprised if he didn't court you, she smiled briefly, appreciating my compliment. I also wanted you to know that I never stopped loving you, even when I was dating him. Even though I slept with Conrad, I never really loved him, and I knew that our affair would end sooner or later. It sounds crazy, but I really thought I could have two men, at least for a while. My affair was never about you, and I wanted you to know that we never really talked about you. In the beginning, after we were over, he tried to humiliate you and I left instead of spending the night with him. I told him that if he ever spoke badly about you again, we would break up. It was after that night that he opened a $250,000 account for me. Wow, I said. I think all those words are from the cheater's handbook in the chapter on what to do when you get caught. 
You know that most cheaters eventually get caught, and you knew that I would never put up with cheating. What exactly did you think would happen when you got caught? I deserve it. I know you have strong moral principles, believe it or not, but that's one of the qualities that attracted me to you back in college. I knew you'd kick me to the curb if you ever found out, but I guess every cheater thinks they're different and will never get caught. I think the danger of being caught is part of the thrill that makes the novel exciting. But of course, it wasn't worth it. I may be a cheater, but you and I both know I'm not a murderer. Tell me, Brian, did you kill Conrad, or did you pay someone to kill him? Nice try, Alice. Did Walker put you up to this? Did he put you under surveillance, hoping I'd confess? She turned pale, letting me know I was on to something. Tell me, dear wife, if I did it, how the hell did I get there? Do you think Captain Kirk beamed me there in the Starship Enterprise? Let's face it, you saw the security footage. Just you and asshole O'Brien were in his house when he had a hole drilled in his head. While we're on the subject, why don't you tell me why you did it? Was he going to break up with you? Did you tell him you loved him and he just laughed and said you were just a good sex toy? Fuck you, she snarled. Thank God, never again, I replied. At that moment, the doorbell rang, heralding the arrival of my lawyer and his notary. I think this conversation is over. It's time to end this shitty marriage, I said as I walked out of my office and headed for the door. For once, Alice had kept her word and signed the divorce papers. In a few months, I would be a free man and my ex would be sitting in one of the state's medium security prisons. I even acted like a gentleman and drove her to jail. Okay, I'll be honest, I wanted to make sure the bitch was locked up and out of my life. Six months later, I was at Lee's house celebrating my final divorce decree that came in the mail earlier in the week. The two of us were sitting at his bar drinking adult beverages, and Lee was smoking a nice cigar. Do you feel any guilt at all? I asked him. Lee looked at me intently. That bastard killed my little sister. He asked for it himself. He may not have pulled the trigger, but he seduced her, a married woman with two children. When her husband found out about her affair and kicked her out, O'Brien broke up with her and fought back. Megan was so upset that she decided she'd rather kill herself than face the consequences. But we both know it was O'Brien's fault. Lee told me about O'Brien and his sister after she died. He had been grief-stricken for weeks. I just nodded in response and Lee paused, taking a deep drag on his cigar. What about you? Do you feel guilty about Alice being locked up for a crime she didn't commit? Not really. Stupid bitch had it coming. She knew I'd turn her into scorched earth if I found out she was cheating, but she did it anyway. And hell, I learned how to fly and land your airplane. That was pretty cool. Besides, someone had to stop O'Brien from going after more married women and ruining more marriages. There's too much damage to be done. Unfortunately, our courts and legal system don't seem to care about that. Sometimes morals and laws don't align. You got that right, brother, Lee said, tilting his long-necked beer toward me and we clinked bottles. We sat in silence for a while, enjoying the evening. We never talked about it afterward. How hard was the surgery for you? How did you feel when you put a bullet between that turd's eyes? I asked. The recoil! That's what I felt! Said Lee and laughed. I knew Lee was in special forces and had probably killed a lot of bad guys, but our mission was still pretty challenging. After his sister's death, Lee had planned to kill O'Brien. His training had taught him to plan things carefully, and I had to admit that his plan was brilliant. I had known Lee for several years and we were good friends. We often went fishing and hunting together. He had carefully surveyed O'Brien's country home on the hill. Before she died, his sister even told him that O'Brien left the cameras pointed outside on, but turned off the cameras indoors when he was there. Information that helped him immensely in his planning. I found out about my wife's affair shortly after it began. She got a text message on her phone from O'Brien with an innocuous message, probably code for dating. What connected Lee's sister Megan and Alice was that they both worked for one of O'Brien's companies. When I first told Lee about Alice's affair with O'Brien, it took some time, but eventually he convinced me to play the long game and not divorce her immediately. While Lee was an experienced assassin, I was virtually useless in our operation, but we were in this together. Lee decided that my role would be to pilot his airplane while he did the wet work. It took Lee several months to teach me how to fly and land his airplane. It was fun, 
but deep down I knew I was only learning to fly to help Lee kill O'Brien, and it sent a chill down my spine. We tracked Alice's movements with the tracker on her car, and I learned the unlock code for her phone. I looked through her messages often to track her upcoming meetings with O'Brien. On the morning of the operation, Lee drove the old Jeep to a secluded spot about a couple of kilometers from O'Brien's house, covered the Jeep with camouflage netting. He removed the license plates and replaced them with plates borrowed from an abandoned car he had found. After hiding the Jeep, I picked him up and dropped him off at his house before returning to his house before noon. That evening I drove to Lee's house and we flew on the airplane just like I told the police, except I was flying. Lee was dressed all in black, with black leather gloves, a balaclava covering his whole face, and night vision goggles. He was a scary bastard. He had a square black military-style parachute, which he said was very maneuverable and should allow him to land on O'Brien's roof or, better yet, on O'Brien's second-floor balcony with a sliding door leading to the upstairs bedroom, O'Brien's master bedroom was downstairs. He also had a backpack with tools and escape gear strapped to the front. I piloted the small airplane at Lee's direction until he felt we were in the perfect spot. Opening the airplane door, he shouted, Let's get this over with, buddy! Overlapping the noise of the propeller and jumped out into the night sky. The conditions were perfect. Darkness, with almost no moonlight and a calm wind that allowed Lee to make a perfect landing on the second floor balcony. He knew from his reconnaissance that there were no cameras pointed at the balcony. He then picked the lock on the balcony door and waited on the balcony until O'Brien arrived and turned off the security cameras in the room. Lee quietly entered the house and crept down the stairs. He told me he wanted to talk to O'Brien before he shot him. We knew from the GPS unit in Alice's car that she was still about an hour away. We didn't think there were any listening devices in the house, but Lee didn't want to take any chances, and in the end, he didn't care at all about what O'Brien might say. He found a spot from where he could watch O'Brien and wait for him to sit down, as he didn't want his victim to get spooked and run outside. As soon as the asshole sat down in his chair, Lee appeared, pointing a gun at O'Brien's head. To say that O'Brien was surprised and scared would be an understatement. Conrad initially thought he was the victim of a home invasion and quickly offered the masked man money and valuables. Keeping the gun pointed at O'Brien's head, Lee calmly approached O'Brien and whispered in his ear, This is payback for Megan. Taking a step back, Lee saw that O'Brien understood the situation and saw that a large amount of urine had accumulated on O'Brien's pants. Lee then pulled the trigger, ending O'Brien's miserable life. Lee's rescue gear was a disassembled lightweight hang glider with lightweight aluminum struts that were fastened together to support the nylon fabric from which the wings were made. It took about 10 minutes to assemble the hang glider. Since the outdoor cameras were pointed downward to pick up intruders, Lee assumed that he only needed to fly about 100 meters away from the house and the cameras would never pick him up. He made sure he had packed all that gear, went out to the balcony and picked the lock again, this time locking it shut. He climbed from the balcony to the roof and used the rope he had tied down to drag the assembled hang glider from the balcony to the roof. Fortunately, the angle of the roof was acceptable, so he carefully climbed with the hang glider to the highest point, put his face in the light breeze, and ran hard on the ridge of the roof with the hang glider in place. He said he must have been pumped with adrenaline, as he probably flew 500 meters before he landed. Once on the ground, Lee disassembled the glider and headed for the jeep. He stowed his gear and drove off into the night. The next day, he got rid of the gun, the hand glider, and the black clothes he was wearing. He even got rid of his shoes so as not to leave any footprints. Hearing Lee reminisce about his part of the mission, I exclaimed, Lee, you've been retired for over ten years, but you still have a skill. Brian, I did it for my little sister. May the earth rest her soul. As Toby Keith once said, I'm not as good as I used to be, but I'm as good as I've always been.